Starting off with number 10, for years there have been rumors about whether or not Harry is actually King Charles's biological son. I mean, do I think the father and son look alike? You never know. Ever since the affair of Princess Diana and James Hewitt was made public, people have suggested that Hewitt could be the biological father of Prince Harry. Someone go find the crumpets because this English tea is hot. Theories have suggested that both Harry and Hewitt have red hair, and also that they look basically the same, but how did the rumor really start? In 1986, just two years before Harry was born, Princess Diana allegedly began an affair with James Hewitt, aka the Horse Whisperer. I too would like to know how he got that name. The couple's relationship reportedly lasted five whole years. What did Hewitt have to say about all this? Well, even though he did say Harry is a handsome chap, he revealed that the news was untrue by saying, I can absolutely assure you that I am not the father. I can understand the interest, but Harry was already walking by the time my relationship with Diana began. Harry had his own thoughts on the theory and was pretty upset when it was suggested that he should take a DNA test. I know who my father is, I am my father's son. Yikes, Harry was not feeling this gossip at all and had to shut down the rumors. Do some of us still believe it to be a possibility? Hey, anything is possible, and we already know about how quick the royals are to cover up rumors that could jeopardize the monarchy. Comment down below if you believe the theories or the royals. Counting down to number 9, more theories suggest Diana and King Charles had a daughter together who is living in the US. What sparked this? It is alleged that Prince William was not his mother's first child. He may have a secret sister, now 33, named Sarah who's living incognito in a small New England town in the United States. Do you think Harry and Meghan made the move to America to be closer to his secret sister? Could be a possibility. According to this crazy claim, Diana was ordered by the Queen to undergo gynecological tests to make sure she was capable of bearing children before her engagement to Charles could be announced. The royals and their traditional protocols. During these tests, Diana's eggs were allegedly harvested and fertilized with Prince Charles's sperm. The tests proved successful and the embryos were ordered to be destroyed. One of the team members who examined Diana, a rogue doctor, secretly held one of the embryos back and implanted it in his own wife. Unknown to her, she became the surrogate mother of the biological child of Charles and Diana. Isn't that an insane story? This royal family is unintentionally involved in the wildest scenarios ever. Having a secret child without knowing is horrifying to think about. I think Sarah should take some tests so we can find out how true this theory is. The late Princess Diana and King Charles had a pretty rocky relationship and it was never hard to see the lack of chemistry and affection in the couple, sadly enough. Princess Diana was torn after finding out about the long affair King Charles was having with Camilla who is now Queen Consort. The extramarital affairs didn't even stop there. Diana confessed that she was also seeing other men during their rocky marriage. And since Charles had already admitted to Diana that he was not in love with her, it seems the princess was going to get affection one way or another. So here's a quick timeline of all the affairs we know of both of them were involved in. According to a leaked conversation about Diana's love for her bodyguard Barry Menaki, he was the greatest love she'd known. James Gilby has always maintained that he was just a friend of Diana's, but there was one phone call that leaked in 1989 known as Squidgy Gate, where Gilby alluded to some NSFW activities and asked Diana to kiss him. This much tea and somehow I still don't have any crumpets. Others who Diana had been linked with include James Hewitt, the horse whisperer who is alleged to be Harry's biological father, and art dealer Oliver Hoare. Charles was infamously dating Camilla for most of his marriage with Diana. In early 1993, the couple's affair was confirmed when a tape recording of an inappropriate conversation between the pair was leaked, creating scandal for the royal family. In her 1995 interview for BBC One's Panorama, Diana famously said, there were three of us in this marriage, so it was a bit crowded. Camilla filed for divorce in January 1995, while Charles and Diana finalized their divorce in August 1996. Another alleged fling Charles had was with Barbara Streisand. 
Charles had a big crush on her and even met Streisand on the set of Funny Girl in the 70s. 20 years later, they had a secret rendezvous at the Bel Air Hotel that no one knows about. Something was going on and Diana knew all about it. Who knows how true this affair is, but regardless, it's something fun to talk about. Streisand may or may not have hooked up with a royal who was crushing hard on her. On to number 7, this one is pretty eerie to think about. Did Diana know she was going to pass away in a tragic way? According to a letter she had sent to her butler which read, I am sitting here at my desk today in October, longing for someone to hug me and encourage me to keep strong and hold my head high. This particular phase of my life is the most dangerous. Someone is planning an accident in my car, brake failure, and serious head injury in order to make the path clear for him to marry. Spooky. Either way, losing the people's princess was a tragic loss. Moving into number six. Okay, let's get a little off topic here. Since the passing of the late Princess Diana, we've come to see how much she has really exposed the royal family. With the new hot topic, Meghan Markle, we can see that when the royals don't like someone, they won't be in the picture for long. It makes me wonder how the two would get along. Do you think Princess Diana and Meghan would? Let me know in the comments down below. Through Princess Diana's actions, careless to be like the other royals, we see similar footsteps being followed with Meghan and Harry. The couple has walked away from royal duties and has moved far away to be nowhere near that lifestyle. Can you blame the two? What would you do if you were Harry and Meghan? Do you think Meghan is trying to be like Diana or do you think she's nowhere near her level? Let us know in the comments down below. I will say there is for sure more to the story that we don't know about. And maybe Prince Harry will give us answers in his new book Spare. I guess that's to be determined. I need the tea. Number 5 on our countdown, despite the threats against their lives, Charles and Diana became intensely secretive as their marriage came to an end, at times even evading their own security team. As a security guard, that must become so exhausting because if anything happened to them, security is definitely getting fired. Diana was the worst, according to the Secret Royals. Even early in her marriage, she became rather good at giving her own security the slip. Like an intelligence operative, she knew how to elude her tail. This caused periodic panics when royal flunkies realized she had slid out to go shopping down the king's road, protected only by a pair of stylish sunglasses. Honestly, relatable Diana, a girl's gotta shop. Having to go everywhere with security would get pretty annoying and if I was her, I'm sure there'd be times I'd wanna sneak out on my own just to be on my own for a little bit. What do you guys think? Was it smart for her to be out and about without security? On to number 4, royals are trained by Britain's elite special forces, so they know what to expect during kidnap and rescue missions. During one session, Princess Diana offered to drive a Range Rover. As she was driving up to the building, the princess forgot to roll up her window, so when the flashbangs exploded, a pellet stuck in her hair, which soon caught fire. As an officer quickly patted the princess's hair to stop it from burning, Prince Charles and his entourage laughed. The training session sounds so fun, but it's good Diana's hair didn't burn. That would've been pretty dangerous. Number 3 on the countdown, the tragic car crash that people are still trying to piece together. There are still many unanswered questions surrounding Princess Diana's passing away and the relationship of Ritz driver Henry Paul with the security services. The acting head of security at the Paris Ritz Hotel was clearly known to several security services, according to the Secret Royals. According to a US law enforcement official, Paul spent the last several hours before the crash with a DGSE spy where he was paid $1,000 and had the cash on him at the time of the crash. It seems these type of arrangements were common at high-end hotels where security teams had to manage guests with weapons or VIP requests. On to number 2, the year 1992 has gone down in history as Queen Elizabeth II's self-proclaimed Annus Horribilis has gone down in history as Queen Elizabeth II's self-proclaimed horrible year. Three of her four children's marriages all ended and their proceedings all played out in the British press. That is pretty rough, but if that's what would make them happy, then what are you gonna do? Charles and Diana's separation dominated headlines, Prince Andrew and Sarah Ferguson split, and Princess Anne divorced her husband, only to start dating a royal employee shortly after. 
To make matters worse, a fire at Windsor Castle destroyed 100 rooms. In a speech marking the 40th year of her reign as queen, Elizabeth said, 1992 is not a year on which I shall look back with undiluted pleasure. A little dramatic for Queen Liz, but as a queen, I'm sure her standards for what a good year would be like. But as a queen, I'm sure her standards for what a good year would look like are much higher, so I guess it's understandable. The top secret revealed by Diana was back in 1995 when the princess agreed to sit down with the BBC's Martin Bashir for an exclusive interview. In the interview, Diana opened up about her marriage to Charles and her experiences with the royal family and admitted that she had also had an affair during her marriage. She revealed that Charles's long affair with Camilla Parker Bowles made her feel worthless. Diana did not care and exposed Charles pretty badly with that. She said that she suspected Charles's staff was waging a campaign against her. In addition to her revelations about the royals, Diana also spoke about her struggles with bulimia, postpartum depression, and self-harm. It's really sad to hear how much the charismatic and charming princess was suffering. Hopefully the newer royals have access to more resources to help with their well-being, as should everyone else. After the interview aired, Queen Elizabeth wrote to the couple, who at that point had been separated since 1992, and told them to proceed with their divorce. In the years following the release of the interview, it's been alleged that the BBC showed Diana's brother fake bank statements that they claimed were proof that the media had been paying the royal family for information about Diana, in order to convince her to tell her side of the story in the interview. While a 1996 investigation proved inconclusive, in 2021, the BBC revealed that they found interviewer Martin Bashir had acted in a deceitful way to ensure the interview would happen. The BBC returned all awards, the interview special one, formally apologized for their actions, and vowed to never air the footage again. As they should, that was a snake move on their part. But drama between the royals and the media is pretty entertaining for the general public. Up with number 10, ever since the royal couple left the royal palace, Meg has been exposing Prince Harry's side of the family. What was life really like inside the palace? A little frosty, according to the American. Meg still finds it weird that no one hugs and thinks everyone is uptight, especially Kate. She said it's obvious that Kate and William do not approve of their choices and that you could cut the tension with a knife. The source went on to say, the duchesses of Cambridge and Sussex rarely interacted during Meg's final trip as a senior royal and even avoided making eye contact. Whatever happened between them must have been serious because avoiding making eye contact is next level. Rumors of a rift between the two duchesses have been dogging the royal family for some time now. However, this damaging narrative really started to take root in 2019 when Markle guest edited the September issue of British Vogue. She neglected to put Middleton on the female forces for change list featured in her issue. Sounds a little shady to me. Describing her early years of her daughter's childhood, Doria recalled repeatedly being asked if she was the nanny as her daughter's skin was lighter. Her mother said, as a parent, in hindsight, I would absolutely like to go back and have that very real conversation about how the world sees you. So when Meg became part of the royal family, she was not used to experiencing extreme levels of racism, which really helped their decision to move to LA. Number nine, the Duchess discussed her estrangement from her father following a controversy over whether he staged a series of paparazzi style photographs in the lead up to their 2018 wedding. Harry described the situation with his father-in-law as incredibly sad. I shouldered that because if Meg wasn't with me, then her dad would still be her dad, he said. Megan opened up about her half-sister Samantha, who she said she hadn't seen since her early 20s, but who frequently spoke of her in the media. Megan said, I don't know your middle name, I don't even know your birthday. You're telling those people that you raised me and you've coined me Princess Pushy. Also interviewed on the show was Ashley Hale, Samantha Markle's estranged daughter, who Megan remains close with. According to Meg, her reception in the palace was pretty cold, saying she felt a lack of warmth at royal family gatherings and finds all this standoffish behavior very odd. 
On to number eight, in contrast to Megan's experiences growing up mixed race, Harry said that there was a huge level of unconscious bias in the royal family. The thing with unconscious bias is actually no one's fault, but once it's been pointed out or identified within yourself, you then need to make it right, he said. On to number seven, Meghan recalled meeting Prince William and his wife Catherine over dinner. Oblivious to royal protocol, she said she was barefoot and wearing ripped jeans at the time. She described herself as a hugger, but said that this can be jarring for some British people. I understand not wearing any shoes in your house, but sometimes being barefoot can be a little too much, especially for the guests. Hopefully Meg knows for next time, to wear sandals, or even just throw some socks on, girl. During her 16-day South Pacific tour, Markle sported several different looks and unfortunately suffered some wardrobe malfunctions along the way. But who doesn't, right? There was one particular feature included in her attire that royal etiquette experts took issue with. She wore a white tuxedo dress during an event in Wellington. The outfit drew praise from fans, but Royal experts were critical of the relaxed look. Markle was captured on camera several times with her hands inside her pockets. A gesture Hansen said was inappropriate for a duchess. There is good casual and there is bad casual. Placing a hand in the pocket is too relaxed and unprofessional. The etiquette guru said it's not too much of a fashion faux pas, though he suggested she avoids tempting fate by opting for dresses and other clothing without pockets in the future. Will the world end? No. It is just a small blip in Meghan's usually delightful manners that can be easily corrected for future engagements, Hansen told the British newspaper. Number six, after news of their relationship broke, Meghan recalled how quickly she became the focus of photographers and the media. The royal family regarded such intrusion almost as a workplace hazard, according to Harry. As far as a lot of the family was concerned, everything that she was being put through, they had been put through as well, Harry said. So it was almost like a rite of passage. But he clarified that the difference is the race element. Tell them, Harry. Let them know. And on to number five, in a telling section on his experience of other royal marriages, Harry said, I think for so many people in the family, especially the men, there can be a temptation or an urge to marry someone who would fit the mold, as opposed to somebody who you perhaps are destined to be with. The difference is between making decisions with your head or your heart. And my mom certainly made most of her decisions, if not all of them, from her heart. And I am my mother's son. Number four, the monarch was unimpressed with Harry's controversial comments about growing up within the royal family, according to a source. But she still has a soft spot for her grandson. Harry was also close with late Philip. Meghan, for her part, spoke highly of the queen during the Paris CBS interview in March 2021. The queen has always been wonderful to me, she said, reflecting on learning to curtsy ahead of their first interaction. When they welcomed their daughter Lily, Elizabeth was apparently overjoyed. With the couple in California full time, they've done their best to stay in touch with Harry's relatives. Before Prince Philip passed away, he had a funny way of ending the Zoom calls. My grandfather, instead of like pressing leave meeting, he would slam the laptop closed, Harry teased in a February interview. In April 2022, Harry and Meghan stopped in England to visit the Queen while on their way to the Invictus Games in the Netherlands. The Prince had not been to the UK since he and William unveiled the statue of their mother in July 2021. While Meghan had not returned since the duo made their royal exit official in March 2020. Back in June of 2022, the Duke and Duchess of Sussex traveled back to the UK to celebrate the monarch's 70 years on the throne during her Platinum Jubilee. While the couple did not stand with the Queen on the Buckingham Palace balcony for the Trooping the Color, they enjoyed the parade from the Major General's office that overlooks the grounds. The Sovereign passed away three months after the Platinum Jubilee. Counting down to number three, Harry has been very vocal about the media's role in his family life starting with footage taken outside the hospital following his birth. Of the ongoing attention throughout his childhood, he recalls the majority of his memories are of being swamped by paparazzi. As a child, he had to learn how to handle the attention. He later talked about how his mother, the late Princess Diana, did a really good job in trying to protect her kids and would even confront the paparazzi. Footage of family ski holidays was also included to highlight this. Being a royal and all, I get why people would want to know what you're up to, but having cameras follow you everywhere, even against your will, that is an exhausting life for sure. 
Would you be able to handle it? On to number two, Harry said that his grandmother, Queen Elizabeth, was the first senior member of the royal family to meet Meghan. Meghan recalled being told that she would have to curtsy, while Harry admitted that to a foreigner, the concept of curtsying to the Queen is weird. He went on to say that members of his family were incredibly impressed, though were uncertain about the difference in their backgrounds and thought that her being a Hollywood actress meant that it won't last. The actress thing was the biggest problem, funnily enough, said Meghan. There was a big idea of what that looks like from the UK standpoint. Hollywood? It was very easy for them to typecast that. While Harry and Meghan visited the Queen in England, the couple made their first official return to royal events during Elizabeth's Platinum Jubilee, a four-day event that honored her 70 years on the throne. The late Queen Liz was unimpressed with Harry's controversial comments about growing up within the royal family, but she still has a soft spot for him as most grandparents would. As he continues to speak out about his experience behind palace walls, Harry has taken aim at his father's parenting, committing to follow a different path with his two kids. I'm gonna make sure I break that cycle so I don't pass it on, Harry said on the Armchair Expert podcast in May 2021. Meghan revealed in an interview with The Cut that Harry felt he lost his dad as a result of stepping down from the royal family. It doesn't have to be the same for them as it was for me and my father Thomas Markle, but that's his decision, she said. And lastly, number one, many of the prince's extended family members have kept relatively quiet about the drama, but both Charles and William have been hurt by Harry's words. The monarch even tried to mediate the situation. A source claims, with the way things are going, Charles may never forgive Harry, which hasn't gone down well with Elizabeth. She felt that he was putting his pride before the interest of the monarchy. That's a true queen right there. That's called good judgment. When the couple announced their plans to take a break from their senior roles in January 2020, the news came as a big shock to those closest to them. Prince William was blindsided by Harry and Meghan's decision and statement. William is incredibly hurt, but at the same time he has his own family to focus on and is trying to move forward with his life. Before he and Meghan settled down in California, the Duke of Sussex attended a series of meetings with his grandmother, Queen Elizabeth, and had a heart-to-heart -heart about the situation. Nearly one year after their initial step away, Buckingham Palace confirmed that Harry and Meg were not gonna return as working royals. This also led to them claiming that they felt a lack of support and lack of understanding from the firm. The royal couple considered revealing the identity of the person who made racist remarks about their son Archie's skin tone, but they decided that sharing this detail was a bad idea. Markle told Winfrey that it would be very damaging to them. During the sit-down conversation, the Duchess of Sussex did say, however, that the unnamed royal asked how dark their first unborn child would be. When Oprah asked Harry if he was okay with identifying that person, he said, that conversation I'm never going to share, but at the time, it was awkward. I was a bit shocked. But he did clarify that it was not Queen Elizabeth or her late husband, Prince Philip, who inquired. Queen Elizabeth did not watch the couple's primetime interview, but it has caused quite a bit of backlash on the royal family's reputation. A Buckingham Palace staffer said, there is a feeling that if it's ignored, it will go away, but surely by now they should have learned that never happens. The royal family was also quietly pleased that the Duchess couldn't make it to Prince Philip's funeral in April since she was heavily pregnant with her second child, Lilibet Diana, and unable to travel. They reportedly feared that she would create a spectacle if she was there. I mean, what else do you expect from an actress? But ouch, the drama between the Sussexes and the royal family has been going on for a while. Every time I find out a new piece of information, it feels like the drama is probably worse than they let on. Coming in at number 10, when news of Harry's book release first dropped, we were all wondering how much Harry was going to expose in the book. Fast forward to today, the book release, the amount of tea spilled and accusations being made can cause serious damage to the reputation of the throne. But considering Harry does doesn't live there anymore, does he care? I wanna say no. 
It's no secret that the royal family drama is pretty intense, especially between princes Harry and William. After reading the book, it's honestly worse than I expected. Harry claims that Will attacked him over an argument they were having over our dear Duchess Meghan. We already knew the family never truly accepted or took a liking to Meg. I mean, she would literally rather live in LA than be a royal. That says a lot. But the heated conversation the brothers were having over her got physical. Harry alleges that Will William knocked him out. Will got hands. This started after Will claimed Meg was difficult, rude, and abrasive. Has his family ever said anything nice about Meg? Also, side note, according to the book, they refer to each other as Harold and Willie. It doesn't get any more British than this. Number 9. Harry claims Charles also once joked about who Harry's father really is. Does Charles know something we don't? The prince explained that when his father met a man in a psychiatric ward claiming to be the Prince of Wales, Charles told the man, I am the Prince of Wales. And then he made a joke saying, who knows if I'm even your real father, perhaps your father really is in Broadmoor, my dear son. Yikes, sounds like Charles was salty. Princess Diana catching strays beyond the grave is insane. It's a good thing they ended up getting a divorce because that was just mean for no reason and obviously Harry didn't like the joke either. He found the joke in poor taste given the rumors about his real father being Hewitt, triggered by his resemblance to the army officer. The late Princess Diana confirmed she had a five-year affair with Hewitt in a now infamous BBC Panorama interview with journalist Martin Bashir. She claimed the relationship started in 1986, two years after the Duke of Sussex was born. Prince Harry added that if the king thought anything about Major Hewitt, he kept it to himself. On to number 8, it's no surprise that Harry spoke about his late mother Princess Diana within the book. The book details how he recreated the journey his late mother took through the Paris Tunnel where she and two others were involved in a fatal car crash. Diana's tragic car accident happened in 1997 when Harry was 12. Harry is quoted as saying he rode past the Ritz where his mother had dinner that fateful night and went through the tunnel along the Seine River at the Pont de l'Alma bridge where the car carrying Diana crashed in August 1997. He was 23 at the time of recreating the route and was visiting Paris for the 2007 Rugby World Cup semi-final. He asked to drive at 65 miles per hour, which was the exact speed her car had supposedly been driving, according to police at the time of the crash. I'd always imagined the tunnel as some treacherous passageway inherently dangerous, but it was just a short, simple, no frills tunnel. Perry says before adding that there was no reason anyone should ever lose their life inside it. Is Harry insinuating something? What do you guys think? Let me know in the comments below. Harry also writes that he asked his driver to go through the tunnel a second time. Even though he initially thought this would give him closure, instead it brought him more pain. It is always sad to lose someone close to you and at the age he lost her at, plus the lack of support he had from the family was more difficult for his grieving process. Separately, Harry also shares his attempt to contact Diana through a woman who claimed to have powers. Harry says the woman offered him a message from Diana. You're living the life she couldn't. You're living the life she wanted for you. The woman told Harry in a message she said was from Diana. Harry's attempts to still contact his mom decades later is sad, but I hope he will find the closure he needs. Seeing Harry get so real in the book is interesting to see, especially since the royals are known to keep the skeletons in the closet. The shady side of Harry makes me feel like he's the black sheep of the family, going against the grain just like his mom. That's pretty iconic if you ask me. Number 7. Queen Consort Camilla Unlike the people's Princess Diana, Camilla has been infamously hated on and not just from the public. The book shows how Harry and Will even had their doubts about Camilla being part of the family. Harry reportedly begged his father not to marry Camilla, who is now queen consort, and feared that she would be a wicked stepmother. Is this another version of the Cinderella story with the evil stepmother? Harry recalled that he and William said they would welcome Camilla into the family, but asked their father not to marry her, calling Camilla the other woman. Harry writes, I remember wondering if she would be cruel to me, if she would be like all the evil stepmothers in the stories, adding, Willie had been suspicious of the other woman for a long time time, which confused and tormented him. When those suspicions were confirmed, he felt agonizing remorse for not having done or said anything before. He also compares meeting her for the first time to getting an injection, writing in the book, close your eyes and you won't even feel it. 
The book also claims King Charles tried to win over the kids before asking the British public to accept his marriage to Camilla and that she held a private audience with Harry in which she appeared bored. Yikes, Camilla really does not care. Some tea to sip on. Do you ever wonder if she just wanted to be with Charles for the status? Prince Harry also writes that he was too young to suspect his father's affair, but notes that his brother harbored suspicions for a long time. It would confuse him and torment him. When they were confirmed, he felt awful remorse for not having said or done anything sooner. The royal adds in the book that as a child, he felt the lack of stability, absence of love and affection in our home. Being part of a royal family may not be as appealing when you find out the things this family prioritizes over affection, but in a way that does make them more relatable since there are families out there that also don't prioritize love and stability. Number 6 Personal Journey As much as Harry has claimed to have suffered as a member of the royals, we can only hope he's on a journey of growing and learning from his mistakes. Now that he's a father, he has more responsibility to make sure he allows his kids to grow up in an environment different from the one he had and hated. Considering all the controversies and hate directed towards both Meg and Harry, do you think this couple will be able to have the life they want for themselves and their kids? In the past year, they have made a lot of headlines about the things they've exposed about the royal family after moving out, which is causing more criticism towards them than the family. But if they want a peaceful life for themselves, would they even want to expose the royals as much as they've done in interviews, a miniseries, and now a book? What do you guys think? Let me know in the comments. Number 5 Army While serving with the British Army in Afghanistan, Harry states that in the heat of combat, he viewed his targets as chess pieces rather than people. That's dark, Harry. The prince completed two tours of Afghanistan, one spanning 2007 to 2008 and the other from 2012 to 2013. Advancements of technology allowed Harry to say with exactness how many enemy combatants I had gotten rid of, adding that it seemed to me essential not to be afraid of that number. So my number is 25, it's not a number that fills me with satisfaction, but nor does it embarrass me, he says. This caused a lot of backlash, as you can imagine. No one wants to hear that you feel no remorse when your goal is to get rid of human beings. Harry also says he used to watch back footage after returning turning to base and that in the din and confusion of combat, he viewed those as the baddies eliminated before they could get rid of the goodies. The remarks have sparked criticism from some British security and military figures, but again, are we shocked? Number 4 Goodbye Queen The memoirs see the Duke reveal his final words to the Queen hours after she passed away on September 8 last year. He hoped she was happy and she was with grandfather now. The book states that Harry learned of his grandmother's passing after checking the BBC News website. Am I the only one who thinks it's strange no one from the family personally gave him the message and he had to find out through the news like everyone else? Harry says that upon arriving at Balmoral, the Scottish home of the royal family, he was greeted by Princess Anne who took him upstairs to where the Queen was lying. I advanced with uncertainty and saw her, he writes in the book. I stayed still, watching her carefully for a good while. He also recalls telling her that he admired her for having carried out her duties until the end. The Platinum Jubilee, the welcoming of the new Prime Minister. That sounds sweet and all, but I'm still not over the fact that he wasn't able to find out with the rest of the family about this news. Regardless of whether he stepped down from his royal duties or stayed, I think considering he is family, that shouldn't have been the way to find out about something as big as the passing of the Queen, who is also his grandmother. It's not a good look for the royals in my opinion. What do you think? On to number 3, in another part of the memoir, it's revealed that Meg allegedly upset Kate by saying she must have baby brain because of her hormones after she had given birth and during the run up to the royal wedding in 2018. I can see how Kate would have taken offense to this depending on the way Meg said it to her. Do you think this was acceptable for Meg to say? Harry describes a 2018 meeting with William and Kate at their residence, which according to the Duke was an attempt to clear the air between both couples. Harry recalls Will calling Meghan rude while pointing his finger, saying these things are not done here, to which Meghan reportedly replied, if you don't mind, keep your finger out my face. Prince Harry also reportedly claims in his book that Kate demanded an apology from Meghan for offending her. Kate allegedly told Meghan that we are not close enough for you to talk about my hormones. 
It's no secret these couples don't necessarily adore one another, but the way Harry exposes them is just so juicy. Harry went on to say that Meghan said she spoke to all her friends that way before his brother Prince William pointed his finger at Meghan and accused her of being rude. The Duchess of Sussex is then said to have declared that she had not wanted to offend Kate. Harry writes in defense of his wife, Meg said that she had never intentionally done anything to offend Kate. What do you guys think? Was this intentional or is Kate just finding reasons to be upset? Number 2. Racism As we all know, Meg has dropped many accusations about racism towards her. With the family's long history of racist allegations, this is another one to add to the list. As a member of the royal family, the conversations they had claimed to have about the color of Harry and Meg's son is really wild to think about. And as infuriating as it was for Meg, it is pretty understandable why she wouldn't want their kids to grow up around people who may not necessarily accept them for their identity. Number 1. Coronation Prince Harry is expected to reveal even more detail about his ongoing rift with the royal family after sitting down for multiple television interviews around his memoir. And in a preview clip of the ITV sit-down released Thursday, Harry says he still believes in the monarchy, but when asked if he anticipates playing a part in its future, he replies, I don't know. Harry is unsure whether his family will return to the UK in May for his father's coronation. There's a lot that can happen between now and then, Harry says in the short clip, but the door is always open, the ball is in their court. There's a lot to be discussed and I really hope that they're willing to sit down and talk about it. Elsewhere in the one minute promo clip, Harry also makes the suggestion that Buckingham Palace planted negative media reports. Responding to Bradby's suggestion, some people will accuse him of invading the family's privacy without permission. Harry says that would be the accusation from the people that don't understand or don't want to believe that my family have been briefing the press. I don't know how staying silent is ever going to make things better, Prince Harry said. Royal tea is being spilled everywhere. Harry is exposing the royals and honestly, I'm here for it. Number 10, one of the most famous secrets Diana exposed was the love triangle she was involved in with Prince Charles and his mistress Camilla. During their marriage, it was a known fact that both partners were involved in extramarital affairs. If you know the royals, you know that they rarely let the public in on any kind of tea. So Diana exposing her husband and the other woman Camilla for crowding their marriage a little bit was pretty iconic. Diana's been known for behaving a little differently compared to how other royal members present themselves to the public. This is mostly why she was referred to as the people's princess. During the interview with Martin Bashir when she confirmed that her husband was having an affair, it was a big thing. No royal had ever been so honest and candid about their personal lives and Diana stuck to her true self of going against the grain. What a queen. Number 9. As we all know, Charles and Diana did not have a picture perfect marriage, as much as the photos of them would suggest. After being together for 15 years, their relationship had come to an end way before they even filed for divorce. Diana even admitted that her wedding day was the worst day of her life, and even though their wedding was the event of the year, watching it all fall apart within a decade was quite the tragedy. Diana revealed to her sisters that she wanted to call off the wedding a week before, mostly because she had found out about his relationship with Camilla. Yeah, that's right, the mistress was in the picture way before Diana even became the wife. Their wedding was reportedly one of the biggest royal weddings because it was the first time in 300 years that a royal was going to marry a British citizen. Diana's been iconic bending all these royal rules, we literally have no other choice but to stand. The infamous interview with Bashir even revealed that she was, as a matter of fact, also having affairs during their marriage. Because she never felt the affection she desired from her husband, Diana was searching for love elsewhere and even found it a couple times. During her five year relationship with James Hewitt, who would eventually end up with false claims that he is Harry's biological dad because of their resemblance. She also fell in love with her bodyguard Barry Manaki, who she'd even described as the greatest love of her life. Unfortunately, their love couldn't live on forever since he lost his life in a tragic motorcycle accident. Diana often turned to her old friend James Gilby during her tumultuous marriage to Charles. The two reconnected in the late 80s and found themselves 
almost at the center of a scandal when a recording of one of their phone conversations was leaked. Known as Squidgy Gate on account of the nickname Gilby called Diana throughout the recording, the convo heard the pair speaking about New Year's Eve in 1989. However, Gilby has reportedly maintained that he was just friends with Diana and nothing else. Sure Gilby, nice cover up. And even though technically we couldn't consider this an extramarital affair because at this point Diana and Charles had been separated, Diana started dating art dealer Oliver Hoare in 1992. The Princess of Wales had known Hoare for quite some time when the alleged affair began as he was close friends with her husband. Damn, Diana really said, if I can't have Charles, I'll have his friends instead. That's cold, but understandable. Number eight, a lot about Diana was revealed after she had made voice recordings to express her deepest thoughts. This was later shared with the world through a project she was involved in, Diana, Her True Story. As for what the recordings contained, Morton says the royal went into great detail about her life at the heart of the world's most famous family. Turning on a battered tape recorder, I listened with mounting astonishment to the unmistakable voice of Princess Diana. She was pouring out a tale of woe in a rapid stream of consciousness, he said. I feel I've been transported into a parallel universe. The princess was talking about her unhappiness and her sense of betrayal and two things I'd never previously heard of, an eating disorder called bulimia nervosa and a woman called Camilla. From the outset of her involvement in the book, Princess Diana wanted to share her lived experience of life as a royal. Some of the biggest revelations from the bestseller include her unhappy childhood after her parents divorce and her struggles with bulimia just one week after her engagement to Prince Charles following an alleged comment that she was chubby. Princess Diana said she was ignored by everyone in the palace upon joining the royal family and given no formal training on royal protocol and that she became a victim of serious depression as a result of Charles and Camilla's relationship. This sad but truthful story really gave people a chance to understand what the princess was going through throughout her life, which again was never done before by any royal members and honestly was a pretty risky move, but by the time it was published, the royal family had very very little control on the stories. Number seven, her conversations surrounding her mental health are probably one of the more important conversations she was part of during her interview with Martin. Diana's candid self-disclosures in these interviews may be her most powerful and unrecognized legacy. Her honesty helped get rid of the stigma surrounding mental health and encouraged others to get help. It is not an exaggeration to say that thousands of people changed their lives because Diana talked about hers. These kind of conversations were far less typical when Diana first opened up about her life experiences. And because of this revelation Diana spoke publicly about, the rates of women seeking treatment for bulimia in Great Britain more than doubled. The press dubbed this phenomenon the Diana effect. If she could explain why she hurt herself, they could recognize that side of themselves too. If she could overcome her eating disorder, they could too. Diana really set trends in more than one area which is pretty remarkable for the times she was living in. Number 6, speaking of being remarkable, the princess once confronted Camilla about her affair with Charles and even said to her, I know what is going on, don't treat me like an idiot. Okay girl, let him know. Camilla then tried to dodge the accusations and Diana remembered Camilla saying that she had everything she could ever want and all the men in the world. When asked what more she could want, Diana told Camilla, I want my husband. Oddly enough, Diana apologized to Camilla for being in the way of her and Charles, but she was still outraged. As sweet as Diana was, she wanted to make sure the wrong people weren't treating her any way she didn't think she needed to be treated. That's some queen behavior right there. There. Number five, during one of Diana's lowest points in life, her handwritten notes were revealed detailing how she believed people were going to try to get rid of her in an accident so that Camilla's path to the throne would be clear. That's creepy. In 1995, after dismissing her royal bodyguards, Diana was driving alone through London when she approached a traffic light. She put her foot on the brake, but nothing happened. Unharmed, she jumped out of the car and took a cab to Kensington Palace. Then she dashed off a note to her friends that said, the brakes of my car have been tampered with. Diana wrote, if something does happen to me, it will be MI5 or MI6. Just 10 months before she arrived in Paris with Dodie, Diana predicted the circumstances surrounding her 
own demise with uncanny accuracy in writing. I am sitting here at my desk today in October, she wrote, longing for someone to hug me and encourage me to keep strong and hold my head high. This particular phase in my life is the most dangerous. My husband is planning an accident in my car, brake failure and serious head injury in order to make the path clear for Charles to marry. And that's where all the conspiracies surrounding the loss of Diana began. Weird, right? Did Diana predict this or was she just really paranoid? What do you guys think? Number four, Princess Diana was one of the most iconic trendsetters, but her fashion choices weren't always improved by the family. She never cared to wear gloves like most women of the family, and she would show more skin for certain events too. Her fashion statements have been noted for decades, with a lot of the trends making a return, especially after the season on The Crown with Diana's storyline. Based on an interview she did with the BBC in 1995, it seems Diana always saw herself as an outsider in the royal family. One time she'd worn a black sheep sweater, which could have been her way of revealing her feelings to the public. I'd like to be a queen of people's hearts, in people's hearts, but I don't see myself being queen of this country, Diana said in the famous BBC interview. I don't think many people will want me to be queen. Actually, when I say many people, I mean the establishment that I married into because they have decided that I'm a non-starter. In Her Royal Highness's So Many Thoughts on Royal Style, Elizabeth Holmes pointed out that Princess Diana drew even more attention to her sweater by wearing a blouse with a black ribbon that pointed directly down to the black sheep. Number three, after Harry was old enough to tell his own story about his mother, we got to learn more about Diana and her life from someone really close to her. After the release of the docuseries Harry and Meghan, it is very relevant that Diana was one of the paparazzi's favorite people to document and after the separation with Charles, this reached new levels. In episode one of his docuseries, Harry addressed the scrutiny his mother faced from the media, both before and after her separation from King Charles. My mom was harassed throughout her life with my dad, Harry said, but after they separated, the harassment went to new levels. Diana and Charles separated in 1992. In 1994, Charles admitted to having an affair with Camilla during an interview with documentary filmmaker Jonathan Dimbleby, and two years later, Charles and Diana had officially filed for divorce after 15 years of marriage. Harry claimed that little was done to protect his mother from the paparazzi, and that media harassment became almost a rite of passage for women marrying into the royal family. The moment she divorced, the moment she left the institution, then she was by herself, Harry continued. Yeah, she may have been one of the most influential, powerful women in the world, but she was completely exposed to this. And even though a lot of people adored Diana, it's an obvious fact that it was never necessary for her every move to be caught on camera. The obsession with Diana was much stronger than anyone else in the family at the time. After her tragic loss, you'd think the press would realize that they don't need to harass the royal members for newsworthy headlines, but then Meghan came into the picture and her treatment by the press has been brutal in different ways too. Number two, when Diana wrote her will, she left an inheritance for Harry and Will. So when Harry moved out of the palace, he claimed that he felt as if Diana almost knew his plans to move out. Because if it wasn't for what she'd left for him, he would have never been able to afford the lifestyle the couple and two children are currently living in LA. What do you guys think? Did Diana have an inkling that Harry would be a black sheep just like her? Number one, there have been many conversations about the relationship between the late Diana and her former mother-in-law, Queen Elizabeth. Some say that the pair never got on, while others maintain that initially there was a bond between the two which soured after the divorce between Diana and Prince Charles. According to royal biographer Andrew Morton in his book Diana Her True Story in her own words, the relationship between Diana and the Queen started off rather formally having been governed by the fact that she was married to her older son and a future monarch. Morton went on to write, in the early days Diana was quite simply terrified of her mother-in-law. She kept the formality, dropping a deep curtsy each time they met, but other Otherwise kept her distance. As the marriage between Prince Charles and Diana began to disintegrate, it was widely reported that the princess initially relied heavily on the queen for advice and support. Morton also confirms this in his biography, adding that Diana found perhaps a rather unlikely ally at the palace in the queen, whose understanding and helpful attitude did much to encourage Diana to soldier on. So what do you guys think? Was the queen and Diana's relationship just as rocky as with ex-husband Charles? 
Or was Diana just intimidated by the queen, limiting themselves from getting to know each other better? That's all for today. Thanks for watching. Make sure you like, comment your thoughts, and subscribe to our channel for more royal updates and juicy news on other celebrities. I'll catch you next time on The Rich Life.